or the leader of the panel, and he handled it not only with professionalism, but also with a sense of humor. And so I knew I wanted to invite him for our keynote. Professor Thorpe is a gerontologist and social epidemiologist with a nationally recognized expertise in minority aging, men's health, and place-based disparities. After completing his bachelor's at Florida A&M, he earned his MA and PhD at Purdue University. His areas of research are broad, for example, looking at environmental exposures and cognitive decline, dementia, and Alzheimer's disease among middle and old black men in the US, as well as longitudinal analytics to investigate how income inequality has influenced health outcomes in US counties. As reflected in the many dozens of articles he has published, he is keenly aware of contemporary issues that affect well being, and his published work has covered environmental racism, social isolation, grocery store avail availability, and even walking the dog. And so I'd like to introduce to you all Professor Thorpe. Thank you so much for joining us. Take Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And I, and I truly apologize for the uh, the technology glitch. Um, but what I want to do is I want to spend the next uh, few minutes sharing with you what um, my career path is, some of my career paths has looked like. And I want to leave some time to think about, uh, to have some questions and answers around this. One of the most exciting things that I do in my job now is I get to develop uh, um, people to their next career transition, starting with uh, undergraduates. My lab is is anchored in a lot of undergraduates, and then we have graduate students. I don't I don't have any postdocs now in this early career faculty members. So I want to tell you just my journey um, through uh, my career, looking at minority agent research. And one of the other things that I do is I'm one of the directors of the uh, of the Alzheimer's Disease Rickmar Center for Minority Agent Research that's been funded by NIA, and I want to say I greatly appreciate all the funding that I've had over my career with uh, NIA. So let me start with uh, giving you a little, I know uh, I was, they, they read the bio, but I want to give you a little bit, a little more nuanced information on my pathway to my research career, because oftentimes we hear talks from people and you, uh, people get up and give you the talk, they march through it, and you think everybody had it together and how they all start, how things all started out. I want to share with you some of the decision-making points in my pathway to my career. As you first heard, I I uh, started out and um, I got my uh, bachelor's degree in theoretical mathematics in 1995 from Florida a and but it was there uh, in, in my senior class, my senior year, where I wanted to, I was taking an abstract, uh, I mean, the theory, yeah, abstract algebra course, and we were working on a proof, and I just, I wasn't really feeling it. I was like, ah, who knows, who cares? The answer's in the back of the book. It's an odd number problem. So the, the answer to the proof's in the back of the book. I'm not really excited about this and so I went and talked to my advisor and said, look, I want to do something more where I can be applied and I can see myself be, being able to do some things that have a better or more, I can see the impact more closely because I couldn't see it from just the theoretical math lens. And at that time, you had to have a, um, you had to have a, a, a a graduate minor, I mean, a minor, an undergraduate minor. And so my undergraduate minor was statistics and I went on to, Purdue University to uh, be in their statistics program. And I started out in the program and I was in yet in another uh, theoretical, I think it was theoretical linear algebra or some theoretical course. And in that course, I wasn't, I just, again, I couldn't quite see the applicability that I wanted to, uh, so where I can help someone. So I talked to my advisor, I said, this isn't really what I want to do. I don't want to go down this, uh, go down this avenue because I just don't feel like it's something I would be happy at doing. And so he said, okay, all right, well, there's a course, you need some electives. There's a course on the other side of campus. There's an epidemiology course. Why don't you go over and sign up and take it? So I went over and I signed up for the course in epidemiology, clinical epidemiology, and I fell in love with it. And so I sw I got my ended up getting my master's degree in statistics and ended up getting my PhD in um, um, ended up getting my PhD in the epidemiology department. And then also during that time, uh, my doctoral program, I was I worked on a graduate minor in gerontology. But it was during this time in my PhD program where I became acutely and keenly interested in this idea of health disparities. Uh, and I, 
I uh, came across this report, and this is a report of the um, Secretary's Task Force on Black and Minority Health. This report is affectionately known as the Heckler Report, and that's for um, the Secretary of um, Health at that time was Margaret Heckler, and this was, I think, a, uh, if I'm not mistaken, a 12-volume report that articulate the stark differences between blacks and whites on a number of health in the health indicators in the United States in 1985 and from this report of findings to Congress spawn a number of different things that we know today the office of minority health at the CDC was spawned from this and a number of other things that have occurred since then including the to what we have now, what is known now to us as the national, um, it's a distant ways off, but it's it reaches back to the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. And I was able to work with Dr. Ken Ferraro at Purdue, who's a gerontologist, and he's the one who got me interested at this intersection of gerontology, which is the gerontology and, and health disparities. So I was so excited about uh, doing that, I finished up my graduate minor in gerontology. Then I came to Johns Hopkins uh, School of uh, Medicine in the Division of Gerontology and Ger Geriatric Medicine to delve deeper in this idea of gerontology and health disparities. So I took a three-year postdoc uh, during this time, and I had the opportunity to meet with a lot of uh, had opportunity to meet with a lot of giants in in the field of gerontology and health disparities. Most uh, notably, I had the honor of working with Dr. Judith Casper, and I had the honor of working with um, and still work uh, on some projects, um, not as much with uh, Dr. Eleanor Simonson of NIA, who was my postdoc advisor, and then Dr. Thomas Lavis. But over that three-year term, that three-year time period, uh, as a postdoc, I was afforded the opportunity to create my program of research. And my program of research broadly looks at trying to understand race and SES differences in health and functional outcomes uh, in mid to late life. And I do that in three, three buckets. I'm not going to go through all the three buckets today for time constraints, but I do want to be able to highlight, and I'll be able to, I'm happy to answer questions about those buckets that I don't highlight today. I do that thinking about the, trying to disentangle race and SES differences. So the question is, is it race or is it SES or is it the combination of race and SES that impact uh, either the differences that we see between groups or does it impact the health and well-being of uh, groups, uh, underrepresented groups? Second area is I look at um, the, the role of place and largely the role of place is place as I look at it as though understanding how segregation impact uh, observed disparities between uh, blacks and whites and also how uh, place as it relates to the form of segregation impacts the health and well-being of African Americans. And then finally, most recently, I uh, looked at uh, this idea of men's health disparities and and um, and most recently thinking about focusing on, on black men's health. And today I just wanted to uh, talk about two, show two projects that, I've, that I'm currently uh, working on that's, that's in these areas in my program of research. But before I do that, my program of research has been, uh, is anchored around this health disparities and uh, research related aid to this framework. This is a very popular framework at NIA. Um, and this, this framework simply articulates to us how we no longer can do silo research. It takes, in order, if we're going to address complex problems, then we're going to have to, we need to have interdisciplinary teams. Um, and so this, when we're thinking about uh, addressing research questions and testing hypotheses and from a health disparities framework, I think we need to think about how can we think about how these things operate together to impact um, disparities and also not only operate together, but how do they operate across the life course? And so having, having said that, just seeing this and, and being able to think through how you will work across these different levels and work across the life course, certainly suggest that you will want to think about engaging in team science so that you can address these strong but yet complex problems that uh, that will still be uh, be before us. And one of the most beautiful things I think about is that, you know, I know that you I'm excited because I know that you all the next generation of uh, scientists, you're going to have a job. 
because we're in a space now where in the by the middle of the century we're being a country where the minority groups become the majority and then what that happens is that our health status will be representative of the minority group and then we need to ensure that we have the appropriate types of care the appropriate types of uh uh, care and, and making sure that people uh, of color are in clinical trials and in research studies so that we can continue to add to the evidence base uh, where we can start to think about um, impacting uh, policy and impacting health promoting strategies. So these, when we think about these, uh, this research framework, we think about it in terms of how can we think about these things working together to address a question? And this, I'm talking about this at a very high level, but in, there are nuances that are within, within these different levels that we should be able, people should be able to think about and think through so we can further advance the uh, health disparities research as it relates to aging. So I wanna turn now and talk to, talk to you about a current study that I'm, working on now is current R01 with um, my colleague, uh, President Whitfield, uh, Keith Whitfield. We're, we're just in the field, we're trying to close out here soon in the field of what we, the study of longevity and stress in African-Americans. We call it the SOLSA study. And this study is really trying to, it's based on the premise that we're really trying to understand longevity in African-Americans. Here, as we see that there's the black-white life expectancy differential. Uh, as the older uh, African-Americans get, the smaller that differential gets. So we hear see at around 80 years of age, blacks and white, there is no differential in life expectancy between blacks and whites. And we see once the, the blacks get to age 90, there's an advantage where blacks tend to live longer than, than whites. The question really becomes, you know, why does this exist and how can we learn from this? Uh, we call these, these African-Americans who live at past um, 80, we, we call them exceptional survivors and they're rare. And uh, we took an opportunity to try to study uh, this group and we have an interdisciplinary team. But one of the things we wanted to also do keeping the research framework in the NIA research framework in mind, we wanted to look at these. We not only wanted to look at how behavior plays in a role uh, between uh, um, a role in understanding the health and well-being of African We want to see how behavior factors interact with bi uh, biological factors. And so, and then we wanted to think about what is the common pathway that links, um, uh, that links uh, race to survival and then stress is this pathway. And so that's one of the, that's the pathway that we articulated. Here we have our specific aims. I want, I want to articulate all of them to you, but what, one of the key things that you'll see in a few slides is that we took this approach for looking at it for using a family study design. And we want that forces the opportunity to understand how stress and stress and COVID, how that impacts across generations or within families. And we can also look at, we collect the data on genes. So we can also see how the genes are associated with stress and longevity across, uh, across families and within families. Um, this is uh, an intergenerational family study. We, our goal was to collect 750 individuals and it was ideally we wanted to have 150 short-lived families and 150 long-lived families. Each of the families would have two siblings and the long-lived families would have one older generation member. I'll show you a picture next. And our eligibility was that individuals had to be, participants had to be at least 50 years of age, they had to live in North Carolina, and then they had to have at least two biological children, and they had to be, the participants had to be cognitively intact. This is what the research design looks like. When I talk about a long-lived family, I'm talking about a family that has a parent that's African-American parents that's 80 plus years old and two living uh, children. And then the short-lived families is a family that doesn't have a, 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 a living parent, but they have the siblings. And this uh, research design affords us a number of different approaches that we could uh, take in our research. We can compare long the, the uh, generational effect, or we can compare siblings for our short-lived and long-lived families, or we can compare siblings within a family. So it forces the opportunity to answer a number of different research questions around this whole central focus of stress and coping and longevity. 
our participants uh, were recruited from a, a different large counties in um, North Carolina uh, and excuse me and we I just have to say that we were impacted like everyone else was with COVID came in we were impacted by COVID and as the the result of uh, it has impacted us but we still are we're not that far off from our goal of 750 and Individuals. I think we're at more like 640 individuals, and this is a, we're very uh, proud of it, um, and we, we do recognize it was a learning experience, particularly for us when COVID hit, and the research in it itself, uh, re the entire research enterprise around the, the country, uh, well, the world for that matter, was shut down, and a learning experience was how do you stand this back up, particularly working with African Americans in, this, in light of all of what's going on around COVID, vaccine has this in the the whole issue how do you go back and start recruitment recruiting again so we we have been recruiting we've we've been sputtering but now we've picked up and so we're back into recruiting and i think we're only we're not that far from reaching our goals so we're very excited about that the second project i want to tell you briefly about is that the one of the projects i'm working on with uh, as it relates to black men, it's the Black Men's Health Project. And this project um, is the project that seeks to try to understand the health trajectories of black men. There's no study to date that focuses uniquely on that, that focuses uniquely on African American men. Yes, indeed, there are a number of studies that have a large proportion of African American men in them, but none that focus exclusively on that. And that was part of our premise to conducting the Black Men's Health Study. We're currently in the field now. While this was a study was done is done online, we still were impacted by. Uh, recruitment, as you might imagine, uh, it was very difficult to recruit during uh, starting in May when the incident with George Floyd and all other incidences were going on with African Americans and other people of color and, and police brutality. Very difficult to recruit during that time, and I think we've turned the corner to start recruiting again. But it's um, it's just a matter of being able to um, deal with what's going on contemporaneously and uh, and the research in itself meeting it at this intersection. So we were, and I can talk a little bit more about this in the Q&A period if we need to. One of the key things that our, that our study does is that we created a survey with the men in mind. So what we did was we went and we had focus groups to try to understand the different determinants of uh, black men's health. We did this by a review of the literature and having focus groups talking to men, tell them what they think their determinant factors for health. And here's a list of them. Now, we're not collecting data on all of these in the survey now, but we are collecting some data on masculinity um, and uh, sexual orientation, religiosity, spirituality, education. And we have, uh, we don't have discrimination, but we have microaggressions in there. And we have some S measures of SES and um, so a measure of social support. So we we're excited about this study and where our goal was to get 5,000 men. We're a little under, I think we're a little under 20, a little under 3,000 men now as of the day with our recruitment. So I think we're doing, we're pretty proud with that. And we're still moving forward to try to reach our goal of 5,000 men. Here's just another uh, select projects that um, I'm working on in my, um, in my research lab as it relates to um, men's health. Some of them, as you can see, look at disparities and others look at uh, just solely on, on black men here. And if you have any questions about this, I'd be more than happy to talk about it. I would not be, uh, I would be remiss if I would uh, tell you that I made, I got to where I am by myself. This is just a smattering of the people who've helped me get to where I am today and inform my thinking and who continue to inform my thinking and uh, and all the funding, particularly the funding from, I'm forever grateful for all the funders and particularly for the National Institutes on aging as it relates to the funding around minority aging research and this research as it relates to thinking about studying older men as it relates to uh, older black men. So finally, I wanna just close out real briefly with 
some things I learned on my journey. And these are three key things that I've learned on my journey that I want to talk briefly about, and then I'll open it up for uh, questions and answer. Uh, the first one is mentorship is very is necessary, it's very important. The fact that you all are in this program and you all have put together, I've looked at the uh, the program and it's an outstanding program. So that lets me know you have outstanding mentors. Um, I, one of the things I tell people all the time is that mentoring is so key and you want to have someone that's going to be able to listen to you, but be able to give you a, a nice push in the right direction and be stern when they, when they need to be stern. Now, I'll say this to you, and I mean this. If your mentor's always telling you doing right, you need to get another mentor. Simply put, you just need to get another mentor because the mentors I know did not tell me everything was right. And it's that small push that they give to help you move forward. And they're not being mean or anything. They just know, they see something in you oftentimes that you don't see in yourself, right? And so they're giving you that small nudge forward so that you can put, you can further improve what you're doing now. But if you have a mentor, you find a mentor that is always telling you, right, yeah, you got to find somebody else. And remember in the mentoring relationship, it's bi-directional and it's a relationship. And so both parties need to think about listening to one another and sometimes they have, may have to come to some type of compromise. The second thing that I learned is that publishing, publishing is very important. If you have an opportunity to publish your work with one of your mentors, I, you know, uh, I would suggest that you take the opportunity, but then have clear expectations. What else needs to be done for you to be considered as an author? Because there are some guidelines on authorship. And I can't think, you know, when I work with my undergraduates, I, you know, we go through, we talk about what authorship is about. And then I invite them to be on uh, papers with me. And then when I think they're ready, they're ready and willing to lead a paper, um, I, I, I help them go through the process. Um, one of the key things I found out about publishing is that a lot of people uh, like to hold on to things and think perfection is what we're shooting for. Perfection in my world doesn't exist, uh, but you can always strive for excellence. I always say 90% and out the door is better than 100% and on your desk. A A is a A is a A. So uh, sometimes let's just think about relinquishing that I know we already know. That you're gonna have trouble writing. So you holding on to it two more weeks ain't gonna, it's not gonna change that much. So let us allow us to work with you and move forward with this. Cause after all, I don't think any of the mentors that are on this call are in the business just to, to see you do wrong. We're all in the business of seeing you be successful. And so allow us to um to help you move those papers forward. And finally, the one thing I think that's very important, I like to close with this, I think it's important that you find your happiness. I, I opened up when I was asked to give this talk, when Dr. Lawton asked me to give this talk, and she asked me to talk about my pathway, I was excited because many times I don't get an opportunity to talk about it. And I want to draw back on that. As when I opened up, I purposely told you I started in math. I didn't feel happy doing that. Then I changed the statistics. I still wasn't happy. Then I changed over and I found something that I like. And I think that's important. And you may, you may already know exactly what you want to do, and it lines up for you. If so, that's absolutely great. If it's not, the bigger point is to be able to know that you don't like that and to find something that you like. Because after all, I think it's important for you to be able to do your work uh, on something that you really enjoy. Because you're, when you're doing research, there are going to be good days and bad days. And that's just how this works, how this business operates. I think finding your happiness is key. I personally can tell you that now I, I, I'm really really excited. I do sit at the corner of happiness and success. And I think this is one of my most favorite quotes. You know, success is not the key to happiness, but happiness is the key to success. If you love what you're doing, you'll be successful. I absolutely love what I'm doing. And I can't think of uh, uh, anything else that I will be doing with my time to get compensated. I really enjoy it. And I'll stop here and I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll take questions. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I see that Roberto Villagomez has, has uh, raised his hand, so ask away. Hi. Um, Hello. I had a question, or I guess firstly a comment. I, um, I thought your comment on how we shouldn't be striving for perfection, we should be striving for excellence. I thought that was very insightful because I'm sure uh, I personally, but I'm sure a lot of other scholars here can uh, could support this that we kind of feel a little bit incompetent in the presence of 
PIs and postdocs whenever we do any task really, because, well, of course, we're, we're just not there yet. And it can be a little bit discouraging to know that uh, these postdocs and these PIs are just levels above us. They have CVs that are pages and pages long, whereas ours are maybe like one or two. And it, it's a bit discouraging to be in there, but we also have to realize that we're gonna get there. And so I thought that was very interesting or um, very insightful that you pointed that out. And I was wondering if you had any kind of advice for whenever you have those feelings of incompetence or that maybe that you might not feel like you belong there. Yeah, so that's a very, that's a very good point. Thank, and thank you for, thank, first of all, thank you for sharing, right? So, and this is something that's very, it's very nimble to talk about, uh, but I, I'll just, just go ahead on it. Is that one, um, uh, Roberto, if I may call you Roberto by your first name, Roberto, I think it's very important for you to understand all of us on this call started at a one page CV or one page resume. No matter what it looks like now, we all started there, right? So that's for one. The second thing is with regard to your comment, the second thing is what I really want you to, to understand is that finding a mentor is very important. And you, when you find that mentor, you need to have conversations and be able to build the relationship in the mentoring relationship so you can have these exact types of conversations, right? I can't tell you with the undergrads that I work with, the, the, the atmosphere I created in my lab is that it's a flat lab. You know, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's Dr. Thorpe. Yeah. He's a PI, but I present and your job is to critique me because that's a skill you're learning and everybody critiques everybody. And we create an environment that's inclusive and that we're only, Roberto, if you were in my lab, we're, and we know this, all, even the undergrads that come in afterward, we're only as strong as the last person that's in the lab, right? Notice I said we're only as strong as the last person that entered the lab, not as weak as the person that entered the lab, because the person is not weak. They're just the last person and we're bringing everybody up to speed. I think it's tweaks in language and it's in, in mindsets, but everybody, I'll just be honest with you, everybody doesn't think that way. I wish they did, but they don't. The reality is they don't think about it. Now, uh, tips for for dealing with these thoughts what you're essentially thinking about is imposter syndrome right and so tips for dealing with that is what I, what i say is to wait and negotiate those things when you start to have those feelings think about what is what is it that is bringing those is prompting those feelings right and if you can figure out what's prompting those feelings then if you can get with your mentor to say you know when i think about i'm just going to give you an example and i'm making this up I'm supposed to write a methods section. And when I think about writing, I get these feelings. And so it, it's, it's, it's about writing and it's not about, oh, Roberto, you can't do it. It's about writing and we need to develop that skill of writing so that you can do that, right? But it's, it's also, you have to be comfortable enough with your mentor to be able to say, hey, you know, when you ask me to write, I really don't feel comfortable writing because I'm just having a difficult time writing. Right. And my response with you, if you were in the lab, I like, yeah, I know. Let me share with you why I know, because I've been there before. So let's work on this together. Right. And it's, it's, a, it's a, a feeling of belonging and inclusiveness, because um, I know I was a math. You saw my trajectory, math, statistics, epidemiology. We don't know how to conjugate subjects and verbs. We have to learn how to write. <laughs> you know, you know, we don't take a lot of courses that allow you to write like if you if I was a undergraduate sociology major where there are writing assignments where we get more practice at it. And so just recognizing that and recognize there's always going to be something, some area that you can grow and learn in. There's another question. Yes, um, yes. Steph, uh, Terry Cronin and then Stephanie. All right. Hi, thank you for that great presentation. I had a question about your longevity study and you were looking at whether or not uh, one, one of your um, cells was whether or not a parent lived 80 plus years. Mm -hmm. You have specific hypotheses about the gender and you know, it, nationally are there is there a great disparity between uh longevity of black men and black women 
So yeah, so it's the, the yeah, great question. So there is a disparity in general that women live longer than men, right? And then when you, even when you stratify by race, it's still the same thing. Black women live longer than black men. Uh, but you know, what's interesting is that we do have uh, some black men in this study that are over, and it's not a lot of them, so we won't be able to test in our positive, but we certainly will be able to probably put together a brief report and describe what they look like because, Having black men, first of all, having black men in a study to participate is is a challenge in and of itself. Then having an uh, eighty plus black men in the study that's another that's another plus for us. So we're really excited about that. We didn't we didn't bait, create any hypothesis on gender among black as it relates to longevity because of the 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 low. We were thinking we were going to get a low sample size of men, but actually based on we have about twenty five percent of the sample uh, of the sample being black men, and that's on course and on par with the other studies that uh, President Whitfield has done in the Black, the Baltimore study of Black age and in the Carolina African-American twin study. So that's about on the par with that. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and our next question, and it may, may be your last one, um, is from Stephanie Nguyen. Um, and do you want to say it out loud or do you want me to read it to you? Read, it's up to you. I think I'll read it. Yeah, so um, I was very curious on the study. So I was asking, did any of your participants in this survey point out other concerns that they thought should be looked at? And how did you decide on the factors that were addressed in the survey? Yeah, so great. Great question. So, um, Stephanie, I should have better articulated that. So, those determinants of health that was on the slide that I show, a lot of them, well, many of them came from the uh, from the focus groups, like, and some of them were not put in the survey. Uh, we 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 elected uh, myself, uh, Dr. Thomas Levis and Dr. Harold Neighbors uh, were the ones that. Uh, I've been working on this and we sat down and decided on which questions would go in. And so the tricky part too is that the one thing I didn't talk about is, is when you're collecting data, one of the things you want to do is you want to minimize, you want to keep the, the survey as short as possible to contain uh, as much information as you want, right? And so when we're talking about recruiting, um, one of the things in our focus groups, we were asking them how long, we asked them how long did they think that they would uh, complete a survey? And they shared with us around the average time was around, I guess, 20, 25 minutes. And so we kept that in mind uh, as well. And so there were some things that we just had to take out because it wouldn't fit in that in that timeline. And we've been very pretty successful with people completing many. It's five, they're set up in five parts. So uh, people completing a lot of the five, all five of parts of the study. So we're, we're, we're very excited about that. One of the things that we did do is where we asked the, uh, we had a, you know, we did some focus groups in different parts of the country on how we thought that the the length of the survey and some of the topics that were going to be on the survey. Thank you. Any other You're questions? Welcome. Any other questions? Hey Sue, there's my Rick, my buddy. How are you? You just popped up on my screen. <laughs> Thank you. You did uh, awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Very good to see you. I'm glad Likewise. you got us in there also, our Rick Martin. Yeah. 